Melissa is a 15-year-old runaway. She has spent the last three years as a ward of the court. Now she's bracing for a tough hearing in front of Judge James Payne. Melissa became a chins, a child in need of services, when her parents' drug addiction left them unable to take care of their kids. And we find out today that Melissa isn't just a teenager. She's also a mom. Her daughter Raven was born seven months earlier with severe brain damage. She has cerebral palsy, and as she gets older and keeps falling off the developmental chart, she's going to have more problems. There's going to be more therapy, whatever. Um, Patty Cavanaugh is the guardian ad litem for Melissa, serving as her representative in court. She's, she's a child herself, and I think she's realizing that now and is in a difficult situation of trying to be a parent and a child. Um, but at the same time, um, she can't be on the run with this baby. And Melissa spent most of her pregnancy on the run with no real place to call home. As her hearing begins in front of Judge Payne, we know Melissa remains a ward of the court. But now we learn Raven is also a child in need of services. Melissa has to listen as the hearing focuses on what should happen to her baby. Raven really needs a caretaker. Melissa's under 18 and she needs a caretaker too. And the foster mother will give everything she can for this baby, but she also needs Melissa's support, including making the most of herself, going back to school, though it's gonna be a very hard thing for her. And if Melissa doesn't make it, um, the, baby, the baby needs to stay with the foster parent. She just really needs to understand that this is crunch time. Melissa, anything you want to say? I understand. I don't care about you. Okay. My job right now on this case is to care about Raven. You've already shown that you don't particularly care in a variety of ways. But you see that young man over there with the glasses standing up? That's Sergeant Terheide. If you take off, I'll ask him to hunt you down and find you and bring you back here. You understand that? And if you happen to decide to leave with Raven, I'll have him and the FBI out looking for you. You will not interfere with the custody of Raven while I have control of her. It's Judge Payne's responsibility in this court hearing to focus solely on the case at hand, the Chins hearing for Raven, who has been in foster care since she was two weeks old. Raven's foster mom is Karen Butterworth. Karen is a married mother with seven children in her home, three biological children, two former foster children she's now adopted, and two medical needs foster babies, including Raven. Well, there's someone who cares for you, isn't it? Why is she willing to do that? Um, because she cares. Cares about what? Me and Raven. She primarily cares about Raven. Because Raven needs someone to care for. But I want you to understand what this is about. How old are you? You're 15, and I'm talking to you like you're 25. Raven is going to receive the care that she needs. I'd like that to be you. I'd like you to participate in that. I'd like you to understand what it is, because you are her mother. But if you can or won't do that, we will find someone who will. And then I'll handle you separately. Melissa has lived in a treatment facility that helps troubled kids since giving birth to Raven in June of 2000. Today, she's being released to the custody of her new foster mom, She'll finally be reunited with Raven. Karen says she's willing to take a chance on giving Melissa a home with her baby. Well, there's someone who cares for you, isn't it? How many people do you have like that? Just her. Not many, huh? You won't find many people. Don't blow this. Judge Payne admits it's a delicate balancing act when it comes to Melissa and Raven. He knows Melissa's life has not been easy, but the judge is firm with Melissa keeping the primary focus on Raven's well-being. Our responsibility is not to worry about the parent, even though the parent is 15, but to talk about this five-month-old, three-month-old child who, in that case, happens to have all sorts of problems because mother put herself at risk when she was pregnant, didn't get prenatal care, and now the child suffers for the rest of her life. I didn't find out I was pregnant until I was four months, but when I did find out I was pregnant, I hid it. Um, for a while, my dad was out of jail, but went back to prison. They were both on drugs, didn't care what I did. Um, we didn't even have the type of relationship where they even knew that I was pregnant. I hid it from them for till I was seven months pregnant. I didn't tell my, my dad went to jail, but my mom, she wasn't even around me enough to know that I was pregnant. Melissa has been in her new foster home exactly one week. Raven has been with this foster family since she was two weeks old. 
Raven's progress has been remarkable, considering her diagnosis at birth. She was 50% brain damaged. They didn't, they couldn't say for sure what her prognosis was, but it was not, it was not good. We've got a lot of education to do. We have um, lots of therapy to do. Um, and we are right now in a honeymoon phase. The experience will be that Melissa will go home, do okay for a period of time, but she will go back into an environment where she's not real comfortable. And she'll get tired of that. She'll leave, hopefully not with the child, in probably three to five months, if not sooner, and go back out on the streets, and then we'll go on with our situation with, with her child. But Melissa is optimistic. Even though she's not been to school since the sixth grade, she says she looks forward to heading back to the classroom for the first time in three years. She knows how she wants things to be in another month. I like to be in school. Um, hopefully things are going better with Raven. Um, I know when you, if you come back and see me in another month, things will be good. Um, as long as I'm around positive people and make positive decisions, I will be doing just fine. <laughs>35 miles south of Indianapolis in rural Bloomington, Indiana, Circuit Court Judge Viola Talaferro begins a long day of CHINS hearings, the acronym for Children in Need of Services. The parents are not always at fault. Sometimes they're simply overwhelmed. Linda Wells is a low-income divorced mother of three. She's in front of Judge Talaferro today because she believes her nine-year-old daughter Chelsea is severely disturbed and out of control. The child is diagnosed oppositional defiant disorder, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and mildly mentally retarded. Chelsea's child welfare case manager Greg Keyes and state's attorney Steve Galvin tell the court that mom can no Linda longer cope. Agrees and in fact uh, has asked for the intervention of the Office of Family and Children in this matter. Is that correct? That's correct. She's trying her best. Is that correct? Yes, she is. In the past, Linda has asked the court for help in dealing with Chelsea's mental health needs. But this is the first time she's asked the state to take her daughter away. Judge Talaferro recognizes how painful the decision is. You really put forth a, well, I don't have the word to describe the effort that you've put forth to keep your daughter at home. Well, there's not a doubt in my mind that the only reason you're doing this is because you feel you simply cannot handle it at home. These cases present enormous problems for parents because the, the cost of caring for them is just overwhelming and many, many, uh, most people cannot afford to pay for the care of these children and there are not enough facilities for them. So you have parents uh, such as Chelsea's mother who will try every way that can be tried to keep the child at home. But if the child is unmanageable, uh, it cannot be done. I've tried to maintain her for nine and a half years and I can't do it no more. And I'm just hoping that they can keep her here in Bloomington at the Stone Belt where I can see her more often. Linda is urging the court to place her daughter closer to home. But the state's attorney has a different facility in mind called Daymar. It's 35 it's miles away. Into Daymar, if possible. That's a little bit further away, Linda. Were you aware of that? Uh, yeah, and we was just wondering if, uh, you know, the state or someone's going to pay for the Daymar. Daymar is an established private facility in Indiana, housing over 160 children with developmental disabilities. And then on a bad day that, um, you know, like if her mind's made up to where she don't want to do nothing, you have to struggle with her, argue, fight her. She's, you know, like if I have to restrain her, she's throwing me around in my living room, you know, picking up boards, hitting me in the head. I've dealt with this for, you know, struggling with it for nine and a half years, you know, trying to keep her from being locked up and taken away from me. Less than a month after her last hearing, Linda returns to court and learns where her daughter will be living. Further that Chelsea should be transferred to Daymar when an opening becomes available. And at Daymar, Chelsea will obtain the special care and treatment provided by Daymar. 
Uh, Damar, of course, is a long-term residential placement and will provide Chelsea with the structure that she needs. Do you agree with that, Ms. Wells? Do you know very much about Damar yet? Uh -uh. Do you want to go up there before your daughter is transferred there? Yeah, I'd there? like to, yeah. Oh, she'll love that because <laughs> she's an outdoor person. Linda makes one visit to Damar before her daughter will move in. She arrives with Chelsea's home-based counselor, Megan Dorland, who helps her through the two-hour tour. So for her, it'd be trying to integrate her into a public classroom, a public school, but right. also in a self-contained, right? Because that's where she went. Right. We, yeah. we have a number of different options. Did you have any other questions about, this is a med room in here? It's usually one staff and two children in here cooking. I think every child yeah. does enjoy that, Chelsea the attention. Loves helping me. That's a nice playground. Living room, family room area, what one of the bedrooms looks like. And we have it pretty divided off, so they have their own privacy. We're going to head to the next building. One staff to four clients over here. That is common. That is very common. Okay. <laughs> but she does like the water, right? Oh, yes, she loves it. <laughs> Each child will have their individual program plan. I'm finding out more about the home and what they provide. And, and I think, it, you know, she does have to come here. I think it this would be a good place for her. That's the goal for all of our kids, to help prepare them to live in, in community settings, whether that be back at home. But no matter how pleased she is with the facility, it's still hard for Linda to come to grips with her decision. It is because I sit at home every night thinking, you know, did I do the right thing? I mean, I know I've got to be doing the right thing because, I mean, I can't give her the special needs that she needs to maintain out here in the world and stuff and I mean but I just still beat myself up thinking am I just giving her up or what but but I want to do the right thing it will be several months before Damar has a room available for Chelsea for now the nine-year-old remains hospitalized just minutes away from her home come summer Chelsea will leave the only life she knows in Bloomington Twenty-seven-year-old mother Mary Gruber is immersed in the juvenile justice and child welfare system. It's a system this divorced single mother of three knows well. As a child, Mary herself was a ward of the state. Today, she enters the courtroom of Indianapolis juvenile judge James Payne without her nine-year-old son, Dwayne. He currently lives in an inpatient treatment facility after setting fire to the family apartment. In an investigation following the fire, it was also alleged that Duane had touched his younger brother and sister's private areas. Duane's former child welfare case manager recommended the nine-year-old be placed in a treatment facility specifically for children with sexual problems. Duane's been gone five months, and Mary wants her son home. The court believes Duane still needs help. Well, they, they, they told me at Resolute that they would not let him come home until my youngest two children can get into counseling and talk about what Wayne's done to them. First of all, Your Honor, my daughter is one, my son is two. They don't know if, if, if he did do it to them, fondled them. They don't know that. They don't know what that is. How, how can they hold my son until they go into counseling? They don't know what it is. How are they going to talk about it? You know Treatment I mean? providers involved with Wayne's case say he shows classic symptoms of early childhood trauma, most likely physical and or sexual abuse. Duane has mentioned such abuse, but because he says it happened before he turned five, his testimony is difficult to substantiate. Duane is now what the court calls a chins case, short for children in need of services. Let's make clear who makes the decisions. They won't make the decision I will. And that decision will be based on, in part on their report, in part on, on the work that you do. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not going to raise him in that facility. Uh, he's going to come home at some point, so I need you to Mary believes to her son is a victim, alleging Duane was molested as a toddler. At the treatment facility where Duane lives, counselors say the nine-year-old has talked about sexual encounters with dozens of other children, including his younger brother and sister. If true, this classifies Duane as a child sexual perpetrator something his mom doesn't like to think about. Dwayne has touched him. So, I mean, even if he did, or if he, I can't say he did. I can't say it didn't happen. But at least I'm aware of it, that it could have happened. And now I can prevent it.
A month after we first meet Mary, she's back before juvenile judge James Payne. Dwayne is still living at a treatment facility, but is in court this time along with his counselors. The hearing is excruciating for Dwayne as he sits and listens to his mother plead with Judge Payne to let him come home. I'm not going to deprive him of the help he would need, but I do want my son home with me. I can take care of my son. I've been taking care of him for five years on my own, and I have two others. I've taken care of three kids for the last five years by myself. I'm not a bad mother. I've always been there. Like I told my son, no matter what you do, I will always be there. I'm not going to give up on you. You are my child. And I beg, I'm not, I asked you, I asked the court to bring him home and let me show you. The behavior that I've read about and the reason that this case came before the court back in January indicated significant issues. And ma'am, while I know no one is suggesting that you're a bad mother, but there is a clear indication that Duane has more problems, more issues, more um, behavior that needs to be addressed that I think can be addressed in this short period of time. Judge Payne realizes the magnitude of this case and the difficulty in handling child sexual perpetrators nationally. 50% of adolescent sex offenders have been sexually abused themselves. 70% have experienced neglect, according to the National Clearinghouse on Family Violence. Dr. Mina Dulkin is a child psychiatrist at Northwestern Memorial and Children's Memorial Hospitals in Chicago. She says she sees children like Duane all too often. Um. The difficult thing is that we know that children who have been abused or traumatized when they're very young, their brains actually change and their hormone systems change so that they remain overactive and over-responsive to stress later. So they're always vulnerable. Duane's been on several medications since he entered the child welfare system five months ago. He has been diagnosed as learning disabled, suffering from attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and has a functioning IQ of 67. Is this nine-year-old a threat to the community? For now, it's decided Duane will not go home. The issue of Duane is much more complicated, but I think fairly clear, and that is we have a nine-year-old boy who has more information and is engaged in more behavior than any nine-year-old should. Judge Payne bases his decision on the testimony he hears in court. Uh, at this point, I think release is premature at best. You're an alleged father? His colleague, child. Mary Beth Bonaventura, is senior judge in gritty blue-collar Gary, Indiana, 135 miles northwest of Indianapolis. The two talk often about their juvenile caseloads. You can't be a normal human being and hear some of this stuff and it not just get to you so bad. Even after 18 years of doing it, you would think you would get used to this or I've kind of seen it all sort of attitude. And, and every time I have hearings of child abuse and neglect, it seems like I'm doing it for the first time. It, it hurts, you know, it just hurts, especially to, to think about that these are children that, you know, nobody's really there to protect. So critical choices are left up to the courts. And another hearing is scheduled for Duane in 60 days. I am a mother. I can take care of my son. I want my son at home. I can give him the help he may need. Later, another hearing. Will Judge Payne see enough progress to send Duane home? But up next, a mother fights for custody of her four-day-old baby. Back in Indianapolis, the judge prepares for an initial hearing for four-day-old Asia Bell. Asia's mother, 28-year-old Vanessa, sits in front of the judge today without her newborn baby. This case came to the courts and the child welfare system when Asia was born cocaine positive. Vanessa has tried to kick her drug habit for years. So far, rehab hasn't worked. So you've already been in rehab. Mm -hmm. Then why would you do it again? Vanessa now has to admit that her daughter is a child in need of services. There's been filed in this case a petition alleging that uh, Asia chi is a child in need of services. Have you received a copy of that petition? Uh, yeah. Do you have a chance to go through that? Yeah. Mother's looking at you again. At Vanessa's side is her mother, who is concerned about the fate of her four-day-old granddaughter. Vivian Bell recognizes Asia is a cocaine baby, but she's determined to support Vanessa and get the baby back. If she did all the things that the court required her to do, would there be any chance at all of her getting the baby back? Well, there's a chance, yeah. 
Sure. It's not our job to take children from parents, but to make sure children are safe and protected. As you sit in court and watch this, it's amazing how not just the parents focus on the reasons why they're not doing things, but everyone else does too. And no one says, literally, no one says, hey, these kids are important. We don't care about you. After court, Vanessa and her mom talk about Vanessa's addiction, a cocaine habit so intense, even at nine months pregnant, Vanessa still could not stay away from the drug. Because she went out two days before she was born and mm -hmm. fell. <laughs> I'm not a drug user. I never have even attempted, don't want to, but I know for a fact that it is some powerful stuff. And it seems to make your mind just make you feel like you crazy. Don't care. It just, you just don't care. The focus for a number of years has been parents and parents' rights to kids. In, in, in what parents are doing or not doing and forgetting about the kids, that these kids are sitting in limbo waiting for that person who is responsible for them to be responsible. And, and it's tough to get the system away from that. Thirty days after we first meet Vanessa, we're back in court again. But this time, the stakes are much higher. Baby Asia has now been in foster care for over a month. This morning is another Chin's hearing, but unlike her first court appearance, today Vanessa is on trial. Child welfare case manager Nancy Brown is about to give some damaging Grace testimony. Right, you swear or affirm the evidence you're about to give in this cause will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth shall be done. At that time, did Vanessa Bell admit to using cocaine during her pregnancy with Asia? Yes. Okay. Did she admit to using up to a week before the delivery of her child? She admitted using it a week before uh -huh. the child, yes. And did she admit to having a substance abuse addiction? Yes. All right. Is there a parent currently, uh, Ms. Brown, who's capable of caring for or appropriately parenting Asia Bell? Not in my opinion, no. Okay. Case manager Brown says Vanessa has three daughters and a son who are in the legal custody of Vanessa's mother. Vanessa's parental rights were terminated to a fifth child, who was also born cocaine positive. But it's now Vanessa's turn to testify. As she takes the stand, the future of her baby girl rests with Judge Payne. Um, I don't know if it matters or not, but I've been going to, um, I've been seeing her every Monday. I've been going to my meetings. I've been clean now for 42 days. Um, Whatever I have to do to get my baby back, I will. That's all. Okay, anything further you want to say? Um, no. I'm trying really hard. Hmm. Did you want her to say something else, ma'am? I didn't want to just emphasize on so much as getting the baby back. I want to emphasize on the whole process of herself staying clean and being a mother and getting her babies back, her baby back. I mean, I just don't want them pimp, make it look like she's just doing it to get the baby back. I want to do it for herself. You know, self-preservation first. She preserve herself, then everything else will fall in place. Anything else? At stake is whether or not Asia will get to leave foster care and go home. But if Judge Payne declares that Asia is a chins, a child in need of services, Vanessa won't be getting her baby back anytime soon. She listens nervously as Judge Payne makes his decision. Uh, the court will find, since Indian law requires that even a reporting of a trace amount of a legend drug or a uh, controlled substance is sufficient for the finding of a child in need of services with the record submitted, the court will find that Vanessa, uh, as to Vanessa Bell, Asia Bell is a child in need of services. She's a good girl. She has a heart of gold, but she just fell through that crack and just couldn't get out. We've had fights and arguments, and, but that, you know, I still love her and I want her to do right and I want her to be a mother to her children like I was a mother to her. But bringing Asia home won't be easy. That will depend on Vanessa's fight to stay clean and ultimately what Judge Payne decides is in the baby's best interest. I just take it one day at a time. It depends on how bad you really want it. If you really want to be sober, stay clean, you can do it. But it's not easy. Like Vanessa and baby Asia, 
Nine-year-old Dwayne's future also lies in the hands of Judge Payne. Ahead, Dwayne learns if he'll get to go home in time for Christmas. Plus the story of a remarkable girl. Through more than 20 foster homes and 13 years in the system, she seems to defy all odds. Every once in a while in the child welfare and juvenile justice system, you meet an exceptional child who seems to defy all the odds. Such is the case with Delina. At 17, Delina has been a ward of the court ever since she can remember. Well, I've always been so independent my whole life um, because well, I've been actually in the system for almost 11 and a half years. Um, I was taken away from my mom whenever I was four and in a foster home until I was 12. And I was in about 15, 20 different foster homes. And, you know, um, I just, I grew up by myself. I had to. Delina comes to court this winter morning for a regularly scheduled review hearing for herself and her son, Gavin. Both mother and son remain wards of the court Delina, and in the same it foster is home. that you remain a ward and in your present placement. Do you agree Judge Talaferro is especially open with Delina in court. She sees the remarkable determination of this like teenage it. mom. Right. So how's the baby? He's great. He is so smart. He's two and a half and I actually have a picture. Oh, I'd love to see it. Okay. Thank you for bringing that. I don't think I've... I did see him once, but he was... Just a baby. Oh, my. How old is he now? As far as Chin's hearings go, Delina seems to be an example of just how resilient kids can be. Delina and her son have been with foster mom Kathy Brown for almost three years. Delina, you've done very well in foster care. There's not been one problem since you've been placed in foster care. Not one. Thank you for bringing the picture. What a healthy child. <laughs> he really is. <laughs> Take care of yourself. See you in about six months. Well, she's done such a great job. Yes, she, she really has. I'm so proud of her. Outside the judge's doors, Delina talks about Gavin's father. Two weeks after um, I got, he left me, which will be Valentine's Day of 98, he went and got with my friend, and now she had a baby. And she was also 14, and he's 22. My mom did let him stay the night with me, which, I mean, if I have a daughter at 14 years old, she's not bringing a 20-year-old man in my house and stay the night with him. In fact, she better not even have a 20-year-old boyfriend. <laughs> Gavin's father is currently serving time for the statutory rape of Delina's friend. Teenage mothers generally face the future alone. Nearly 80% of the fathers of children born to teenage mothers never marry mom and pay on average just $800 a year in child support. That's a scary proposition for a young person to face adulthood as a single parent uh, without, with limited education, with limited job skills. I don't know how the, some of the young people survive. I blame my mom for the things that she's done to me. Um, like my mom kicked me out of my house whenever I was pregnant. Finally, they put me with my foster mom that I have now and she is wonderful. I've been there since my son was three months old, and I probably won't leave until I'm like 20, <laughs> something like that. Foster mom Kathy Brown has been a big influence in Delina's life. Delina has been in dozens of foster homes since she was a toddler, but this is a house she calls a home. Delina and Gavin moved in when Delina was 15, and Gavin was just three months old. Kathy admits that it's tough to think about the day the two of them will move out. The longer they stay with me, the greater our bond is. And um, one of the things Delina does really well, or tries to do really well, is think about what's best for Gavin. She can't always make her decisions based on that, but she tries. And I think she probably believes that it's good for Gavin to continue to see me, and, and I think that it's good for her to see me. Dr. Mina Dokun is a child and adolescent psychiatrist and believes lack of stability is a huge problem for kids in the system. Child welfare or child protection systems often compound the results of the abuse because they take the child out and they put them here and then here and then here and then here. And it's not at all uncommon for us to see children who've been in five or six foster homes by the time they're six. And, you know, it's very, very difficult uh, to help children when they've had so much lack of stability. Dancing at the party. You went dancing at the party. <laughs> but to kids like Delina, 
who seemingly break the cycle ever fully escape. The odds are against her, but Delina's determined to make it. I've always been there. Like I told my son, no matter what you do, I will always be there. When we last saw 27-year-old mom, Mary Groover, she was fighting to get her son I back. Beg, I'm not, I asked you, I asked the court to bring him home and let me show you. Dwayne had set fire to the family apartment and is believed to have acted out sexually with other children. Dwayne has been living at a residential treatment facility for child sexual perpetrators for the past seven months. Today, the judge learns the necessary safety plan, an agreement between the court and Dwayne's mom, Mary, that lays out Dwayne's supervision once he returns home, is not yet complete. Dwayne won't go home today, but there is an end in sight. We'll set this matter in 60 days on. So he'll be home within 30 days? Mm -hmm. That is the plan of Family Works, that he'll be home within 30 days. What they talk about in the cycle of violence, what one generation tolerates, the next will take to excess. The abused child tends to become an abusive parent, and parents tend to have two children. So that, that abused child will be an abusive parent to two children who will tend to be abusive toward their two children, which is a total of four. So we're going from one to two to four to eight. We're going up geometrically. It's my experience that most perpetrators have been victims. Unfortunately, I don't see a lot of success rate in treatment of perpetrators, adult or children. Georgette Powell is Duane's child welfare case manager. You get to the point where you see perpetrators not prosecuted, getting to walk the streets, adults. You see kids that aren't really getting the therapeutic services they need. You have parents who just walk away from their kids and never look back. For Mary, the cycle of violence is vivid. She describes her own childhood as a lot tougher than Dwayne's. Because my son ain't being abused like I was. My son ain't being molested like I was. My son ain't going through hell like I did. And my son ain't struggling like I did. When we see the family in court again for Duane's review hearing, a month and a half has passed since the previous hearing. Duane is back living at home with his mom and siblings. A safety plan is in place to lower the risk of Duane acting out sexually. Judge Payne looks forward to closing this nine-month-old case. Should temporary extended in-home visit to continue, set this matter for December 22nd at 8.30 and look forward to closing this out on that date. Anything further? While things seem to be looking better for Duane, sex abuse statistics are far less encouraging. Nationally, more than 100,000 children are confirmed as victims of sexual abuse annually, according to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. As for Duane, he's back home in time for Christmas. But for this nine-year-old and his family, as we'll see, this story is far from over. And true to her word, a month after our first visit, Melissa is adapting to her new high school. Child welfare case manager Gretchen Gentry is at Melissa's foster home today to check on Melissa's progress. This is my first time since the incident, so yeah, I will. Right. You scared? Melissa is also learning to take care of her baby. This includes administering seizure medication to Raven. Today will be the first time Melissa does it herself. It is care fate. And how many times a day does she take him? Go look at her chart. I know she takes it. Six, no. ten, two, and six. Yep, milliliter. Milliliter. Yep. So would it be right there? Uh-uh, uh-uh. You want me to do the other two while you pull up the tiger top? I forgot how much she takes it. Can we put 2.5 mils in it? Right there. Just shake it. The top of the black line, because if you put them upside down, Don't they'll leak it. out. Melissa knows this current shared foster placement for her and her daughter Raven is as close as she'll come to a family at this stage in her life. She misses her brother, who is in a separate foster home, and her sister, who is currently a runaway. Melissa says she still loves her parents, but doesn't let herself think about being with her mom and dad anymore. When I ran away, I was around my mom and my dad, and I seen that they didn't want to make no changes in their life. They um, wanted to keep doing what they wanted to do, and don't want to take care of their kids, don't want to try, so I gave up on that. I do. Melissa has been out of her home and awarded the court over 15 months. Today, by law, 
the state must file a termination of parental rights petition against Melissa's parents. The termination is not automatic, but unless there's a compelling reason to drop it, the hearing to completely sever all parental rights will be finalized anywhere from 90 days to one year. Okay, come here. <laughs> Melissa's parents declined to talk oh, on camera, so but say they are remorseful that their family has been torn apart. Chin up. Sure you okay? Okay. Cause number 2000 JC704 in the matter of Raven. In less than a week's time, Melissa returns to Judge Payne's court for a review on her daughter Raven's case. It's just five days later, but the situation between Melissa and her foster mom takes a drastic turn. After months of living under the same roof, molding as a family, raising Raven together and turning her life around, it seems Melissa has started to feel the pull of her old friends and family. Things are beginning to unravel. Um, she refuses to be accountable and she refuses to be honest about her actions. Anything else I need to know? No, that would be it. Melissa, anything you want to say? Nope. I thought I was pretty direct with you last time. It was. Some of our kids start to do real well and then figure they don't deserve it. Or they don't like it. Or it's not as much fun as it was on the street. Are you there? Is that what you've decided? No. Well, you've got two worlds. The one you're living in right now and the one you used to live in. You cannot have both. Which one do you want? I want the one I have now. Then you're going to have to give up on the other one. Your grades, how are they? They're good. No, they're not. They're great. Yeah. Okay, so you're doing everything right, except you're tr starting to get back to where you used to be. My job is the accountability arm. I will hold you accountable, Melissa. Chicago's Cook County Public Guardian, Patrick Murphy, knows how hard it is for kids to break the bond with old friends and family. But he says there comes a point when the state must terminate a parent's rights if it's in the child's best interest. Our government and all governments have traditionally deferred to the family and said, how you raise your children within certain limits is up to you. At some point, I think we have to start taking that line and making a little firmer because we defer too often to a lot of people who are doing a horrible job of raising their kids. At what point does the state step in? And at what point does the state say, I'm sorry, you're doing a terrible job, we're going to take them away. But once we do that then, we have to provide the professional resources for these kids. The Adoption and uh, Save Families Act, we um, have got some now guidelines that we have to move children through the system somewhat faster than we ever did before, uh, which has really you know, helped because it, it makes caseworkers put their feet to the fire and do their jobs a little faster than they otherwise would have. It makes court schedule cases. Every, we hear cases now every three and six months for review, where in the past you reviewed matters every year, sometimes 18 months. No matter how tough things get, Melissa says she's determined to carve the right path for herself you ready? and Raven. Want to take your medicine, honey? I know when I spoke to Melissa, her goals were uh, a week and a month at a time, and we're looking at years at a time. Nationally, so. fewer than one-third of teenage mothers finish high school. Yet after being away from school for three years, Melissa is earning straight A's. Her confidence is intact, and she says she's looking forward to her next hearing on May 24th. I know what changes I have to make and I can do it. When we last saw Duane and his mother Mary in front of juvenile judge James Payne, life seemed to be moving in the right direction. Duane was home, doing well, and glad to be back in the family's small inner city apartment with his younger brother and sister. There was hope that Duane's case would soon be closed. This is where we'd like to say the story ends. But just four weeks after returning home, and three weeks after his 10th birthday, there is a stunning development. Indianapolis police arrest Duane. He is accused of molesting a five-year-old neighbor girl. I don't know what happened. I don't know. I, I want him to be back home, but I guess he just needs help before he can come back home. Duane is locked up in the Marion County Juvenile Detention Facility.
just two floors below Judge Payne's court. He is housed with 140 kids, all juvenile delinquents, while he waits for a court hearing to determine his fate. As shocking as Duane's story might seem, just across the Indiana state line, Cook County Public Guardian Patrick Murphy says he talks to kids every day who tell him horrific stories about their childhoods. We have kids who have been tortured, who have been raped, who have been uh, left alone, who have then come into the system and gone through as many as 30 separate foster homes. You sit and talk to kids who have been chewed up, whose spirits have been crushed, whose souls have been crushed, who have nothing left in them. How do you look at a 12 and a 14 year old and say, you know, their lives are over, they don't count anymore. It's a, it's, you know, it's a minor holocaust what we're doing these kids. The next time we see Duane, it's three weeks later, the day Judge Payne had planned to close this case for good. Instead, he faces a 10-year-old who enters his court wearing a blue jumpsuit. After a draining hearing, the judge decides to place Duane at a local hospital in Indianapolis where he can receive a full psychiatric evaluation. Judge Payne is troubled by the trend he sees in his court. Caseloads doubling in just 36 months' time, and younger kids like Duane facing unimaginable childhoods. In our court, younger kids are getting harmed. It's not 10, 11, 12-year-olds who are getting spanked or whipped or beaten. It is now kids born in the hospital cocaine positive, kids who are being sexually abused uh, under the age of one. It's getting younger and it's getting worse. Marion County Prosecutor Scott Newman is in charge of Duane's delinquency case. There's no secret to how you get someone like Duane Groover. Uh, you immerse a child in a lot of bad adult behavior, whether it's prostitution or drugs or domestic violence, then you pluck him out and you leave him in the cold without any kind of male authority figure, and there you get somebody like Duane Groover. And just when you think you've seen the last of him, Duane's story will take even more dramatic twists and turns during our two-year journey following his case. This is a day 38-year-old mom, Linda Wells, and her husband, Willie, are finding hard to comprehend. It's time to move their young 10-year-old daughter, Chelsea, to Damar, a long-term residential placement facility in Indianapolis. Chelsea is here today because six months ago, Linda asked the state to take her child she could no longer cope with Chelsea's challenging behavior. Linda and the Damar staff have tried to prepare Chelsea for today's move, but at just 10 years old, Chelsea is completely overwhelmed. Carla Bill is admissions director at Damar. She knows what an emotional time this is for Chelsea and her family, and does her best to make Chelsea feel at home. Chelsea will share her new dorm with eight other girls and attend school on the Damar campus. She lights up when she finally gets to see what the kids at Damar love most, the pool. After her tour of the Damar campus, Chelsea heads back to her dorm where with her mom by her side, she quietly eats her first lunch at her new home. After lunch, Linda tries to stay positive as all of Chelsea's belongings are moved into her new room. These are dirty. It's a toy chest. Another pair of shoes. We're straightening them in there too, okay? Hey, mom, my hand. My Linda knows her time with Chelsea is beginning to run out. I knew this day was going to be coming, but now reality just set in. You're going to have some fun up here, right? <gasps> Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
Don't cry. <laughs> Three kids. Chelsea, do you want to see what things that you could earn? You see our stickers and friends? Things like that? Yeah. But you need to tell mom to see her later, okay? Because she'll come visit you, okay? She'll come visit. Give me a hug. I love you. I love you. Don't cry. Don't do this. Do you want to see your pants and stickers? The last time we saw 15-year-old Melissa, she was struggling with the lure of her old friends and feeling trapped in a life of perpetual foster care. But after thinking about how far she had come and the future she wanted for herself and her baby Raven, Melissa seemed back on track. I know for sure things will be better. I know what changes I have to make and I can do it. After all the hard work, all the positive signs, and her repeated apparent good intentions, the next chapter in Melissa's story is a stunning one that makes local headline news. This missing teen and mother is a ward of the court along with her infant daughter. Exactly 29 days after telling us she could make it, Melissa crawled through her bedroom window, stole her foster parents' car, and ran away with 11-month-old Raven. She and her child were in the foster home, and she took off. Judge Payne makes an urgent early morning phone call to the county director of the Division of Family and Children. The judge is on a mission to find Melissa and Raven. There's a detective in, I think it is Johnson County, Amanda Kees, Kiesling, who has put out a nationwide bulletin for her. And remember Sergeant Terheide, the face Judge Payne told Melissa to take a hard look at when we first met her four months earlier? That's Sergeant Terheide. If you take off, I'll ask him to hunt you down and find you and bring you back here. That same Sergeant Terheide is now officially in charge of finding Melissa and checking in by phone. Y'all yeah, call the uh, Hendricks County uh, deputy and see if she has anything first. Across town, after foster mom Karen Butterworth wakes up to the realization that Melissa and Raven are gone, she is in shock. So she's going to be so stupid. I was so stupid. Because Matt's keys were missing yesterday off Kara's key ring, and I had a thought, and I didn't go with it. I thought, check Melissa's room, and I thought, well, no, because this trust thing, and she got me. I was stupid. You will not interfere with the custody of Raven while I have Judge control. Payne is no stranger to cases like Melissa's. Melissa knows the streets well. She spent nearly five months on the run when she was pregnant with Raven. The United States has the highest teen pregnancy rate of any developed nation. Problems related to teen pregnancy cost taxpayers seven billion dollars a year. So for juvenile judges like Judge Payne, this Saturday morning crisis is no surprise. It, uh, unfortunately, it's, it's our kids and um, adults typically indicate what children should do and they do it. They, they teach the behavior and kids model it and then we blame kids for the problems. This is. This is predictable. It's now been two days since Melissa ran away with Raven. The longer they're gone, the worse the odds are that they'll be found. But local TV stations are turning up the heat, and for Melissa, hiding forever won't be easy. When we first met Vanessa over 30 days ago in Judge Payne's court, the fate of her baby, Asia, was still hanging in the balance. Asia was born cocaine positive, declared a ward of the court, and placed in foster care. It's now a month later. Today, Vanessa and her four children arrive at a family and child visitation facility called Giant Steps. This is the only place where Vanessa is allowed to visit her baby, 
Vanessa gets to see Asia every Monday for one hour. Dang, she got cuter. <laughs> Say hello. Can I hold her, Mama? Let me hold her for a minute. Ronnie Taylor is vice president and CEO of Giant Steps and is supervising today's visit. Families are required to see their children at least once a week by a state statute until they lose the rights of the children, if they do lose the rights. So a lot of times if families don't participate, they lose rights to their kids. Cocaine use among pregnant women is especially tough to deal with, according to Dr. Tacoma McKnight, professor of obstetrics and gynecology at Northwestern University Medical School. Cocaine, I think, scared all of us in, in the field of obstetrics. It's just a very highly addictive type of a drug. So women have a very difficult time in kicking the habit um, during their pregnancies. It, it just really is that way. Vanessa's one hour weekly visit with Asia is over. Vanessa is not the only one who hates to see the time end. Leaving their baby sister is especially hard for nine-year-old Calvin and six-year-old Vivian. Now my gut feeling is that it's going to turn out great, but at the same time, you never know because with the drug problem, it's really hard to predict because one difficult life situation can drop a person off the wagon and you never know, you know, just one bad day could change everything, so it's hard to say at this point. Vanessa returns for her third court visit today, where she'll learn what the state and the court have planned for Asia's future. Judge Payne listens to testimony from Catherine Brown, attorney for the Division of Family and Children. Vanessa knows she won't have many more chances. This is it, perhaps her final shot at getting her daughter well. back. I've been doing everything I'm supposed to do. I know I've been wrong, I've done wrong in my past. And it's getting better. It's going to get better. The hearing is long, but at the last minute, Vanessa gets some positive news. Judge Payne decides he's going to continue to review her case. He gives her the chance to remain in counseling and work toward getting Asia back. But if one time you don't do something, if you miss a class, they will have the right to come back in here and say, we're through. We want to move on with Asia going to someone else to live forever. Do you understand that? In other words, your ability to get Asia is going to be real tough, isn't it? You can't make a mistake. He's working with me. A lot of judges wouldn't do that. He's giving me a chance to get my child back. Since we met her almost five months earlier, Vanessa has made an obvious transformation in her appearance, in her mental attitude, in her determination. I see friends that still use every day, like when I go to the store and stuff like that, and they, Vanessa, why you look good? And you know, I always hear, I get compliments all the time. When we visit her at home where she lives with her kids, her mom and dad and her extended family, we get an even better picture of how she's been able to come this far. The love and support of her family who refused to let cocaine destroy Vanessa's life. By me being on drugs, it wasn't the atmosphere or from the family I was I come from. It was my choice. I'm not from a bad background, you know. I don't have a bad background. I just it was my choice and it was a ugly choice. After nearly five months, Vanessa is still clean. She helps around the house by babysitting. Vanessa doesn't have Asia back yet, but she's meeting every milestone required by the courts, made every court appearance never missed a visit with Asia, and continues on her quest for a life free of drugs. She knows she can't make one mistake. If she does, baby Asia will almost certainly be placed for adoption. With the help of her family, Vanessa is making it one step at a time. Uh, it's more like a hope thing right now. Six months ago, when we first met Delina, she told us her remarkable story. Over 20 foster homes, 11 different schools, having a baby at 14, and then at age 16, waging her own successful fight to terminate her biological mother's parental rights over her. Now at age 17, Delina has been in the child welfare system for most of her life. 
for Monroe Circuit Court Judge Viola Talaferro. Delina's case represents that special something that helps keep her going through all the difficult times on the bench. Well, she's done such a great job. She really has. I'm so proud of her. But shortly after the heartwarming court hearing where she shows Judge Talaferro pictures of her son Gavin, her situation takes a turn for the worse. As her 18th birthday approaches, Delina forges two checks from her foster mom, then runs away from home. I don't know why I did it, and I didn't need the money. I had no reason to do it, but I did. After a week on the run without her little boy, Delina couldn't take it anymore and called her home-based counselor. I said, I can't do this anymore. I need to see him. I took myself to the youth shelter, and then I lost him, and I haven't seen him. I didn't get to see him for weeks, for weeks, and that was just... And then the first time I saw him, the first thing he said to me was, Mommy, are you sad? Now Delina is allowed to see her son twice a week. Delina is in a new foster home as she awaits her trial. Because she's a flight risk, Delina's time with Gavin is supervised by social worker Becky Rose. Gavin still lives with foster mom Kathy Brown. Delina knows there's always the chance she could lose her son for good if she takes another wrong turn. It's a tense summer morning when Delina arrives at the courthouse for her initial delinquency hearing. This is the same hallway where, six months ago, Delina told us she would probably live with foster mom Kathy Brown until she was 20. And she's wonderful. I've been there since my son was three months old, and I probably won't leave until I'm like 20, <laughs> something like that. Today, Kathy and Delina don't even look at each other. It's not the check forging or running away that stuns Kathy. She says the most painful realization is that Delina wants to live somewhere else. We've repaired so many damages over the last two and a half years. And then the idea that she's not willing to repair and, and rebuild the relationship so that she and Gavin and I could be together just breaks my heart. <laughs> just a few feet away, Delina nervously waits for her court hearing. She says she never thought she'd be in this much trouble when she forged the checks and ran away. Now I'm sitting here and I'm wondering whether or not I'm going to go to prison or not. Delena, you are charged with three uh, delinquent acts. Count one, theft. Count two, theft. Count three, forgery. It's surprising, but we shouldn't be so surprised because, after all, it has to be frightening for a young person almost 18 years of age uh, without a solid family, without family support, the things that many of us take for granted. Uh, does that excuse her behavior? No. But at least it, it gives us a glimpse of the problems that she's having. Delina is relieved to learn that today's hearing is mostly formality. But in 30 days, she will face the biggest challenge of her life, her trial. When we last left 15-year-old Melissa, she'd run away in the middle of the night with her 11-month-old daughter, Raven. Judge Payne and a police detective were scouring the city for signs of Melissa and her baby. Foster mom Karen Butterworth also had local TV stations reporting the story. Less than a week after she ran away, the Butterworths get the call they've been waiting for. Melissa, with Raven, finally turns herself in to local police. It's now time to pick up Raven at a local hospital where yeah. she'd been taken for observation. I, I have to wonder what all she's been through from all the places I hear that, uh, you know, two o'clock in the morning getting up and moving somewhere. I just, you know, it's... It... While Karen is reunited with Raven, she knows Melissa sits in a jail cell waiting to find out the consequences of her actions. In just two days, Melissa will have to return to court. I think she'll be very remorseful and very emotional, and um, I think she'll be scared to death. By the time we see Melissa one last time, it's three months later, and she's in juvenile court facing charges of auto theft and neglect. Are you asking at this time that I accept this plea agreement and your admission to count one the petition of auto theft? Yes, sir. You understand that by After striking this... a plea agreement, the state of Indiana decides to drop Melissa's neglect charges in exchange for her guilty plea to auto theft. Until her final disposition, or sentencing hearing, 
Melissa will remain locked up in the Marion County Juvenile Detention Facility. What Melissa needs is to understand that she is not a responsible human being yet. She's 15 years old. If she can learn to be dependent at this point on the right person, she has a chance. Those were Judge Payne's words six months earlier. Now this Chen's child, this child in need of services, is also a juvenile delinquent. Still, we couldn't help but remember Melissa the way we saw her so many times over the last six months. Her mind made up that she was going to make it as a teenager, as a student, as a mom. If you come back and see me another month, things will be good. Um, uh, I just know they'll be good. Um, I have my mind set for what I want to do, so um, as long as I'm around positive people and make positive decisions, I will be doing just fine. <laughs> it was 30 days ago that 17-year-old Delina sat in front of Circuit Court Judge Viola Talaferro after being charged with two delinquent acts of theft and forgery. It's now a month later, and on this warm, overcast morning in Bloomington, Indiana, today is Delina's trial. After 13 years in the child welfare system, no one involved in Delina's case ever thought they'd see a day like today. As to the allegations you committed the crime of forgery, what exactly did you do? I wrote two checks and signed Kathy's name. And you intended to commit the crime of forgery when you did that? Yes. Delina is on trial for forging two checks totaling almost $400 from her foster mom of three years, Kathy Brown. Deputy Prosecuting Attorney Brett Raper tries to understand why a model foster child like Delina would steal from a foster mother she says she loves. What were you going to do with the money uh, that you received from these items? I was going to give it to a person that I liked, that wanted it. Things don't get any better for Delina, as her probation officer, Pam Kane, is called to the witness stand. What was recommended at the detention hearing was that she not go to detention because she was going to go to school and maintain employment. Um, the very next day I found out that she was not going to work and that she skipped school the next day after that detention hearing. Um, since that time, I believe she's also tested positive on a drug screen. Next, Delina's child welfare case manager, Michelle Fields, takes the stand. Delina knows with each round of testimony, Judge Talaferro is forming a decision on what should happen to her. Uh, one of the recommendations is that Delena go to secure detention uh, today uh, for five days of the 30 possible days. Any concerns about that? I don't think she understands that if she were an adult, five days would be a miracle. In addition, she has a child that this is affecting. Delena's case manager does point out, however, that Delina spent years in the system playing by the rules, gaining the admiration of nearly everyone at the Monroe County Office of Family and Children. She was considered the star child, you know, one of the kids on our caseload that you talk highly about, that you say, I wish I had more kids like Delina. As nervous as Delina is about the testimony from her case manager and probation officer, nothing prepares her for the last person to take the stand. Former foster mom Kathy Brown, who still has custody of Delina's three-year-old son. I agree with the recommendations. Delina said to me, Kathy, I never meant to hurt you. I didn't think you'd find out. This did hurt you very much, though, doesn't it? it, it it's been devastating. I told Delina in the first time we ever met when she said, I just want a place to live where I'm wanted. I want to be part of a family. I said, that's what I want. I want a, a family. I wanted to be Delina's mother and Gavin's grandmother. I've been saving for her college. I didn't know what else to do when I found out she forged the checks. 
than to, to press criminal charges. It's similar to what happened last summer when she took my Mac card and took $300 out. And when, um, she, when I confronted her with it, she denied it. And then when she realized I was going to watch a videotape of the transaction, she admitted to, to doing it. I, I want her to accept some responsibility. Delena, could you look at me? For what she's done to me. And from her own heart, make some amends, as opposed to people telling her what she has to do. With Kathy Brown and her childhood friends looking on, Delina can barely fight through her words as she makes one last attempt to convince the judge that she should not be sent to secure detention. I just want everyone to know that's been involved in my case and that I know that I have been a disappointment and that I am very angry at myself and that I want to be a good person and I want to do good things and I want to succeed and I don't want to go through the court system like this. I hate it. So I, I just do want everybody to know that regardless of if you don't think that I and remorseful. I am, and I am truly sorry. After almost an hour in the courtroom, it's now up to Judge Talaferro, not a jury, to decide Delina's fate. There's been a lot of discussion by almost everyone about whether or not uh, Delena should go to detention, as if that is the only issue in front of this court. That's not the only issue. First of all, the most important thing is what are the appropriate consequences for a young person who commits theft and forgery? Is Delena a bad person? I don't think so. Is her behavior unacceptable? Of course. So what is appropriate will be four months of formal probation, 30 days in a security detention facility, participation in the Victim Offender Reconciliation Program, and monetary restitution to be paid in full to Kathy Brown, complete the Youth Education Shoplifting Program in order to understand the effects of stealing, complete the brief intensive group at the Center for Behavioral Health to address Delena's substance abuse issues, 40 hours of public restitution. Now, I have not said exactly what the recommendations are. I am going to send you to detention today for five days, and I will suspend the 25 days. So you will go now with Miss Kane out of this room, out of this door. And Delena, I wish that I could have seen you walk out of the door leading to the outside. She wasn't here for all of the good she'd done in the past. She was here because she committed two offenses. Stop. Hi, Pam Kane, probation. Need to go from three to two, please. This is what I deserve. I don't want to go, but this is what I have to do. Her future's in her hands. I do not know what that will be. And can I have holding on second floor? Ahead, after two years and unimaginable turmoil, our conclusion to the story of Dwayne. I've always been there. Like I told my son, no matter what you do, I will always be there. It's been two years since we met nine-year-old Dwayne and his mom, Mary. And I beg for and it's been over a year since we last saw Dwayne. That was right after his arrest on allegations that he molested a five-year-old neighbor girl. At age 11, the picture of Dwayne's life is still completely unclear. For Dwayne, his mom, and Judge Payne, the court hearings never end. He said they're gonna ask for a continuance. The we'll toughest issue here. to tackle is whether or not Dwayne is competent to stand trial for the alleged molestation. Dwayne has now been out of his home for two years and currently lives at Lutherwood, 
a residential treatment facility in Indianapolis. Today is Duane's 20th court hearing since we met him in 1999. So, even if they drop the criminal charges, he don't get to come home? Not until he's competent. He's going to be a competent human being and understand the difference between right and wrong. But he's not going to go back into the community, back in the neighborhoods, back into the home until he understands the difference between right and wrong. So everything we're doing now is for nothing? I don't know that it's for nothing. It still will help him, but he... I mean, we've been dealing this two years. He's not going to get incompetent. He is slow. What are you going to do, keep him until he's 20, 30 years old? Not until he's 20 or 30. Our jurisdiction will lose either at the age of 18 or 21. So you'll keep him until then? If I have to. So, so let me ask you one more question. What rights do I have to my child? None? We have the right as a parent as long as he's uh, being taken care of and others are safe. So basically I have no right to him. I didn't say that. If he can't come home and he can't come and visit me, then basically I have no right to him. We have no right to have him in your home as long as he's not competent and doesn't understand the difference between right and wrong so that placing him back in the home may put him back in and others in the same position that happened the last time he was placed there. Judge Payne orders Duane to remain a ward of the court and continue to live at Lutherwood. They're good to you where you are, aren't they? You have fun, right? You just want to come home. But you're happy where you are, aren't you? It's better than juvenile or in other places, ain't it? Duane's case manager. Georgette Powell. Dwayne has such a low functioning base level that we aren't sure how much he actually comprehends. So it, it is difficult. And, and sometimes children with these problems grow up to be sociopaths. I have three kids. And believe it or not, and this is embarrassing and this is a shame for me to say it. Three kids. Every one of the, and they all have different fathers. Every one of their fathers went to prison for child molesting and got six months in six months probation. And I have an eight-year-old boy that gets one child molest case, and look where he is. Marion County Prosecutor Scott Newman says it's almost impossible to figure out the best way to handle a traumatic situation like Duane's. The problem with Duane's case is he's so young and so limited mentally, according to the experts, that uh, he has not been found competent to stand trial. So you've got this, this wicked combination of very serious crimes uh, that you are unable to bring to trial because at the same time that he's doing these things, uh, he is simply not competent in the way we understand the criminal justice system to stand trial as a, as a criminal. Prosecutor Newman is no stranger to Duane's family history. Duane's father, Bobby, is currently in jail. He's been estranged from the family since Duane was five. And after two and a half years on this story, we finally meet Bobby Groover, who is locked up for battery, aggravated battery, and being a habitual offender. He also served two years in prison for child molesting. It was child molesting stuff, but I was living with the girl. The girl was living with me and everything. I was taking care of her. How old was she? She was 13 and everything. And it just led to one thing to another and stuff. And I meant that I did wrong and everything. I already paid for that time and everything. Bobby tells us it's been almost two years since he's seen Dwayne. He learned from us that Dwayne was arrested and is now considered a child sexual perpetrator. I just never thought that he would grow up to be like that. Why would he do something like that and stuff? He must have seen somebody do it or something. It's now three months later, back to court with Mary and Duane. The issue of Duane's competency to stand trial continues to cloud his case. Prosecuting attorney Troy Rivera says the state is not ready to drop Duane's delinquency charges. At this point in time, the uh, state is still awaiting uh, as to the issue of competency, and that has not been resolved as of yet. The state would ask for this to be set for another continuance. Judge Payne agrees to continue the delinquency matter. He then turns his attention to the problems that brought Duane to court in the first place. He listens to Duane's counselor from Lutherwood. Duane's doing very well in our highly structured therapeutic system, and he's showing less symptoms of his sexual abuse and traumatization. We still have to be very concrete with him in therapy and in our uh, individual and group sessions. Uh, he still doesn't seem to understand why he can't go home and live with his mother at this time. 
uh, or his charges. He's been performing extremely well in school with A's, B's, and C's because of the high level of structure. As the hearing continues, Mary is in for a huge surprise. Because Duane has been away from home for so long, federal and state law says the state must begin the process of taking her child away, legally, permanently, terminating her parental rights. We staffed this case for mandatory termination and have determined that it's not in his best interest at this time to pursue that. Doesn't state law require the filing and dismissal? Um, I believe it does, and we will file. I don't understand what any of the stuff they said. I don't know what all this stuff means. If a child has been out of the home 15 of the last 22 months, we are required to file a petition for termination of parental rights. So that's what's happening right now. Do you understand that, that Mary? Sense. I think she was completely confused about the termination. So take that don't worry about it. It, You're fine. It's, we're required by law to file this petition because he's been out of your home since November of 1999. And the law says we have to file it, but that doesn't mean that it's going to go anywhere. And if the court decides to pursue it, you'll be appointed, most likely be appointed an attorney to help you with that. So you'll be fine. If they terminate him, I won't get him back? If they terminate, that's correct. I won't? I know. Right. If they terminate, you won't get him back. Ever? As has been the case nearly every time we've been with him, Dwayne leaves court today to return to his placement facility. Dr. Judith Campbell is Dwayne's child and adolescent psychiatrist at Lutherwood. When I see him, usually he's um, hard to pin down. He's always got a lot of energy and is looking this way and that. Um, uh, enthusiastic, um, excited about whatever he's doing at the time. And um, I think those are all assets that we can use to build on. He's got to learn some uh, personal responsibility and also he needs to understand better social skills and rules of life. And he, he's got a long way to go for that still. Unless Duane has drastic changes in his comprehension, Duane will probably remain in institutionalization even beyond 18, because many times when children are in institutions for a length of time, um, they, be, they begin to become institutionalized, and we see that in the, in the Department of Corrections, too. We see adults who can't function on the outside. They have to be in the institution. Time and again, if the adults are prosecuted, they either don't get prosecuted or they get such short sentences. If Duane were 30 years old, he probably would have been gone out of the system 18 months ago. Though Duane continued to make progress at Lutherwood, no one can say for certain if he'll ever leave an institutional setting or return home. And so, after two and a half years, 25 court hearings, seven placements, and over $200,000 in taxpayer money, what do we really know about Duane? What do we really know about the millions of abused, neglected, and at-risk children who fill our juvenile courtrooms every day? This shouldn't happen in our country. We should not have children who are abused. That shouldn't happen. Why did this have to happen to my family? Parents on drugs, teenagers getting pregnant, doing drugs, nobody cares. You're an alleged father. Why should I have to sit here and tell you how to raise your child? I mean, to me, it just seems like you should know that. You should be born knowing those things. But unfortunately, there are people that don't. And there are people that are very cruel, uh, people that don't have a conscience, people that just think that this is my child. I brought you into this world. I can take you out. I would hope there's hope, but I wouldn't guarantee it and I wouldn't promise it. Taking care of the millions of at-risk children is an overwhelming challenge. We wish we could say that our exceptional access over the last two years 
has yielded some clear answers for improving America's child welfare systems. But long-term solutions are not easy to come by. What we have found is inspiration in the work of judges, foster parents, and caseworkers. So many people dedicated to improving the lives of these children and hoping to break the cycle of abuse and neglect. For MSNBC, I'm Forrest Sawyer.